Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey everybody, if you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello! And welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an absolutely awesome talk with Texas Tech's Director of Speed and Power Development, Scott Saulwasser. Guys, after a real quick intro, Scott dives right into talking about how he separates his guys into different groups and where he gathers information about each position from in order to increase the carryover in everything they're doing from training to the football field. Then he dives down into the planning rabbit hole and talks about the uniqueness of the football schedule and how sometimes we worry too much about our progressions as coaches and less about where the guys are in the year. Um, And how he sees that is really a major issue with with many of the traditional models of speed development when it comes to to training football players. Scott then shares with us how he looks at agility work and how he advances it and and the importance of not just technique, but visual acuity on top of that. You know, we finish off talking about his programming of jumps and plyometrics, um, you know, and, and where he sees those fitting in, you know, the, the two roles that he sees jump training and plyometrics in his program. Guys, this is really, really an awesome talk. I, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Well, let's get right to it. Scott, thanks a lot for taking the time to be with us today, bud. Thanks, Jay. I'm a big fan of your show. So uh, obviously, when you contacted me and, and gave me the opportunity to be on, I was I was excited. Well, thank you very much, man. I appreciate the words, and I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing down there in Lubbock. You know, and, and listening to you talk, if, you know, I've probably listened to the one you did with Joel about 30 times at this point. <laughs> and it's, uh, but for like the I don't know the one person who now is listening and is like, who is this guy? Let Let's give everybody the quick Cliff Notes version as to where you are and how you got down there. Okay, so I'm I'm the direct I'm currently the director of speed and power development at Texas Tech, um, and I work exclusively with football. And uh, my main duties are are our speed and movement program. 
So both linear, multi-directional, uh, also the plyometric program um, for all position groups. And then in the weight room, I primarily work with uh, skill positions, wide receivers and DBs. But um, as far as our movement program, our uh, explosive movement, agility, all of that, um, I'm in charge of that. And uh, we try to make it. I think the unique thing about what we do is we try to make it as position specific um, as possible. So which um, I'm sure we'll spend more time talking about, but uh, it's, it's a pretty big undertaking. But I really think that's one of the things that we do that's unique. Um, along with some of the other stuff we'll talk about. Um, so how did I get here? Um, prior to this, I was at Cal for four years um, uh, in much the same role, um, although I didn't have the same formal title that I do. In, in I served much the same function there, working a lot with the speed and, and plyometric program, multidirectional and, and skill position players. Um, prior to that, I actually was at Sparta Performance Science, so um, I know they've they've kind of really blown up, so to speak, um, with their force plate platform and all that. And I, I was in on that, um, you know, in 2011. So kind of right when they really started to take off, I had the opportunity of, of working there for a little over a year. Um, prior to that, I was at Louisiana Lafayette with uh, Coach Rusty Witt, who is actually our head of strength and conditioning here at Texas Tech. Um, and he's basically the reason why I'm here. You know, he, um, we had a good relationship, um, at Louisiana Lafayette worked well together. And so when he came down here, um, asked me to be, a a, a big part of the staff down here. So that's how I got here. Um, started out at Sacramento state university, which is FCS school. I was a GA there, um, a full-time assistant there prior to Louisiana Lafayette. And somewhere in there, I had two separate internships with the Oakland Raiders uh, totaling a year. Um, so that's my story. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, listen, your title is unique and what you guys do there is. I, so I think that we should probably start with, you know, when you're looking at, at the vast array of, of different qualities that need to be trained in American football, how are you separating these men and putting them in not just buckets, but even like individual mm -hmm. categories on top of that. Mm -hmm. uh, well, obviously, um, by position primarily, um, you know, and, and that requires a knowledge of the sport of football and the position groups um, respective to each other. You know, it's, 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 I think that's really where our profession is going is you've got to have a grasp of the sport. I think that's not to say that general means aren't important, just lifting weights, heavy squats, heavy deadlifts. I mean, that, that's not to say that that's not important, but I think that now to really be great, you've got to have a working knowledge of your sport. And so when you say, how do we divide these groups up? It's, it's, it's basically based off of that, the knowing the needs of the position um, as well as the individual. Um, that, that certainly plays a role as well. But most of the, the work that we do that's individualized is based off of position. Going to position meetings, conversations with position coaches, um, watching the sport, conversing with athletes, um, trying, to, trying to gather the most knowledge that we can about the needs of each position. That's, that would be the buckets so to speak. Now, does that mean that everything that we do is individualized? No, because there's a lot of stuff your your general preparatory exercises that everyone's going to benefit from they still are football players so at, to some extent they still need a lot of the same qualities they all to some extent need maximal strength they all to some extent need explosive strength etc it just might be the way that we train those um for each group might be slightly different and then of course the movement the the their movement skills out on the field um will, especially in terms of multi-directional movement, quote-unquote agility, will uh, will be different. So, 100%. And then when you look at football as a whole, since it is, I mean, beyond just the game being so unique, the calendar is exceptionally unique. And I would think that that would be a, a very unique challenge for someone in your position. Mm -hmm. How does, like, the macro prep to the spring ball prep to the the right. multiple in seasons to the summer. How does that affect right. how you alter and, and move, you know, through your yearly plan? Right. So this this is something that that 
I feel very strongly about. I'm glad you asked this question. So, it's, it's, and I'll speak uh, specifically in terms of speed development, since that's my title and that's that's one thing I've kind of built a name for myself for. Um, you're right. You do have a challenging yearly calendar, specifically a fairly short winter prior to spring football, right? And the, the traditional model of speed development, which which I advocate as well, would be a short to long model, right? Working on shorter accelerations and then adding distance and adding speed. But here's the here's the trick and here's the problem. Everybody loves their beautiful laid out progressions, right? Progress, progress, this to that, and it's a progression and this is f- foundational level and that this, that, and the other. But last time I checked, when you get to spring football, guys have to run full speed and they might have to run full speed more than like 10 or 20 yards. Unless you've got a deal with your football coach, hey, coach, we're only halfway through our speed progression. Can you keep everything under 20 yards? That's We all laugh, right, because that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> but most strength coaches across the country, there we are, you know, in the winter, and we're doing our foundational agilities, and we're doing our short starts and excels, and then we hit spring ball. And then all bets are off. And then it's like, why do we have all these soft tissue injuries? Well, because nobody ran further than 20 yards full speed. You know what I mean? So uh, I always try to, um, as early as possible, work in full speed sprinting, um, obviously in an intelligent fashion, but as well as maximal velocity work for the skill guys. Right from week one, we were doing build ups, <laughs> step over runs. Um, you know, foundational maximal velocity work with the skill guys. Um, obviously not. I didn't come right out and run 40s and 60s and whatever, but we worked max V from week one because I know by the time they hit spring ball, they've got to be able to sprint upwards of 40 to 60 yards full speed. We're doing special teams, right, in spring ball. We're doing special teams. They're going to run long distances at full speed. So, um, And then change of direction, obviously, um, it's not foundational, it's football, right? So that doesn't mean, long story short, I'm not saying don't have a progression. Obviously have a progression, but rather than getting lost in your Excel spreadsheet, look at where you need to be at certain times of the year and make sure the athletes are ready, right? And if that means that you've got to go a little bit faster in your progression than you would like, you might have to because they've got to be exposed to certain qualities before they hit spring football. No, and I love that, man. I, that's, that's absolutely fantastic because I think that if you don't expose them to it, then obviously that's when bad things happen. So if we if we haven't hit those numbers and we haven't hit those velocities, then it's you're kind of like you know dancing with fire a little bit. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and and like I said, you know, have your progression, have have it all laid out, but just know where you need to be. Don't. Don't tell me that you're still on, you know, shuffle cut step because that's all the athletes are ready for and then cut them loose and have them play football, you know, like they, they've, you've got to get them ready. And, and here's another thing too, you've got to not only get them ready for the physical force demands of football, but also, and this is, I guess, kind of what I've been popular or, or uh for known for i guess you could say lately is also the perceptual demands being able to connect the environment and what they perceive and and how they own it to their movement skills as well because if you just put them in a completely closed environment of course they're they're, going to have nice pristine biomechanics in that environment right and and that's great and they should and that's probably you know, that's probably where they should all start. But at some point, you've got to put them in a little more chaotic, unpredictable environment uh, if you're truly getting them ready for their sport, even in the spring, I believe. A hundred percent. And a lot of people are starting to talk more and more about how those alterations and that chaotic stuff actually is better for motor learning on top of how your vision connects into so much of that. So for people that right now heard what you just said and their head's spinning, mm-hmm. break down that a little bit. Let's talk about how you get to that and then how maybe okay. you restart it, you know, this time of year 
or in a few weeks coming back in the summer to reprep that for camp. Right, <clears throat> right. So uh, obviously your typical agility drills or what would be called uh, closed drills would be cone drills, even, even your your traditional 5-10-5 or, or basically stuff where you know where you're going and, and what's going to happen prior to the movement. And those are nice because it allows us the ability to really hone in on biomechanics and focus on proper foot placement, proper angles, um, et cetera. And, and I like those, and you know, I, I like those too, because since you know what's coming, you can really move at a very high speed and expose them to high forces and, um, higher speeds, et cetera. So they have a place, but uh, what I noticed is why the guys that were good at those closed drills couldn't transfer it to the field. And I think that's where that's kind of how I got down this rabbit hole is why can these guys that run fast pro agilities kill all the cone drills and then they get out on the field and they're unsure of themselves and they play slow. And that was me when I played, I played at UC Davis um, out in California, which is an FCS school. Now mm -hmm. we were division two and I won, you know, we'd test in the off season and I'd win and then on film, I'd be like, God, I look so slow. It was because I was a bad decision maker. And that was what I noticed with some of our athletes. They're, they weren't fast enough decision makers. They were fast when they knew what was coming in a predictable environment, poor decision makers. And then some of our other athletes, and everybody, everyone knows the stereotypical linebacker that doesn't run a great 40, but you know he makes plays because he's one step ahead of the Everyone knows that stereotype, but the thing is, is that that, that applies to all positions, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it, it really, that's the direction we need to go in is it doesn't have to be either, or you can have great athletes and give them the perceptive awareness abilities of that uh, stereotypical guy who's a step slow. And when you have the best of both worlds, wow, now you've really got something, right? So it made me wonder, why is this not transferring? And I was like, because everything we do is pre-programmed. Yeah, these guys have pristine biomechanics, but why doesn't it look like that on the field? Well, that's because when it, when you get out in live bullets, you don't know what's coming. The, the, the environment is rapidly changing. You know, like, it's like I always tell recruits when I kind of talk about, you know, what we do differently, et cetera. You go to the combine, if someone jumps out in front of you when you're running one of those agility drills unpredictably, the security guards come and take them off, right? Because that's not that's not what happens, right? Or when you're running the 40. But in football, it happens all the time, right? So you've got to put them in those environments. And so I'm not saying don't do closed drills. That can be the foundation. But once you're happy with their biomechanics, then you need to move to the brain. Then you need to move to behaviors uh, uh, and put them in situations that are more authentic to football, so to speak. So, and, and people have been doing this. It's not like it's new. It just hasn't been done to the extent or, or with the understanding that I think it, it deserves. So take your typical, everyone does the football wave drill where we all look at the coach, right? And mm -hmm. I point right and y'all go right. And I point left and y'all go left. I mean, that, that's, it's basically that, but in more environments that are more alike, uh, more similar to what you're going to see on the field. So um, the, the simplest at the very basic level could be uh, me versus you in a mirror type <laughs> drill where, you know, um, you're I say it's five yards wide and I shuffle and you just have to mirror me. If, if you ask me to, to pick the most basic fundamental level drill uh, of the stuff that we're talking about, that would be it, right? Very simple, um, not many options. And then if you say how to progress it, well, along the continuum, you would go from a smaller space to a larger space. You would go from less movement options to more movement options. So like we just said in, in, our, in our fundamental drill, all we could do is shuffle side to side. Well, maybe now they can run, they can shuffle, maybe they can move backwards, you know, et cetera. And then you've expanded the space. So now instead of just five yards, maybe it's 15 yards. And maybe now instead of just side to side, maybe it's a square and you've got freedom to move throughout the square, um, et cetera. So then obviously with more options 
and more movement choices, it becomes more challenging on each other to try to manipulate each other and manipulate the opponent. And then you say, well, where are we going with all of this? We're, we're moving from, just like in our strength training, what do we do in our strength training? We move from general to specific, right? Well, you do the same thing with movement, from general to specific. So initially, maybe our, we are doing just like a little basic mirror drill general, right? But maybe um, as we move closer and closer, all we're doing really is progressing the movement closer and closer to the playbook, right? So, so now we look at peaking a little bit differently. Instead of just peaking physical abilities, we're peaking perceptual abilities as well. We're getting closer and closer to the playbook. So now maybe you're doing things like, all right, you've got from the numbers – to the sideline and you got a guy on the 10 and he's trying to get into the end zone and I'm on the goal line and I've got to attack him and get to him before he gets to the end zone or something like that. You know, try to, all you're doing is basically taking a, a snapshot of a moment in a football game or, or for those of us that don't do football, another game and trying to recapture that and not only recapture the movement, but recapture but capture the environment, capture all of the nuances and the perception and, and the environment that, that you're going to have to interact with, with that. I love it. And it, it's, it, I think that it's something that, as you stated a couple times, is something that's exceptionally overlooked. And I think that that, that kind of progression or, you know, just consistent movement towards the specific is where people have a hard time because in different sports, I think that what you were just talking about is something that we do with our movement stuff and our cuts when it comes to how we do things within our offense. Um, and I think that there's a lot of strength coaches who might be worried that that may kind of cross that boundary a little bit where I couldn't disagree more. Right, right, yeah. So... You know, and I, I think in addition to that, the other thing that, that scares coaches a little bit is that it doesn't always look perfect, yeah. you know, but in a way, that's a benefit because they're not always going to be in perfect positions out on the field, right? So you're, you're kind of teaching them to move rather than in a perfect environment, you're teaching them to move in an authentic environment, which to me is more powerful. You know, and, and, and as far as what you were talking about, I think alluding to crossing the boundary between uh, strength and conditioning and sport coaching, I think that's the whole problem is that there even is that boundary. We should the – co the coaches need to understand what we're doing and we need to understand what the coaches are doing better because it's all one thing. Everyone likes to grab, you know, what's theirs and say, mine, mine, mine. You know, really, it's it's ours, 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 right? There's no reason I shouldn't be able to, to sit in a position meeting and understand what's going on. That's not to say that I'm going to grab a headset and call plays, you know, but, but I got to understand what's going on. And then the sport coaches need to understand load management and, and see things, you know, from our point of view as well. And I think the more that we as a profession can communicate – and, and, and it starts by us extend, extending the olive branch and understanding the sport. As long as we try to be meatheads and only worry about pushing numbers, 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 and mine, 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 and we, we have to do this a certain way on our end, you know, I think, I think we, we fracture that relationship a little bit. I mean, it's all just one part of a whole, you know, and, and I think that this – this is just one way. And, and here's the thing, too, because I get this question a lot. People will say, well, so what do you just like get the drills from football practice or do you just ask the coaches? for? No, I don't want the coaches drills. And that's not to say that that they are, aren't good drills, but there has to be variety. Just like in the weight room, you don't go in and do three sets of 10 of the same exercise every time. Variety and movement is good as well. So if I just copied football or just copied football practice, then yeah, I would just be redoing football practice. I want to try to learn about situations that they're going to be in and then recreate those situations in my own way with drills that aren't the same. And the reason that we want to do that is so that they become adaptable, 
right? It's the same thing trained a bunch of different ways. It's like everybody knows, all right, <clears throat> think it's, it's almost like, and, and I, I hate to like bastardize this, but like, it's almost like West side for movement, right? You're going to train maximal strength and we're going to train maximal strength, um, a different way each time we each week right well, we're gonna we're gonna train me versus you in the open field the situation is the situation but one time we're gonna train that situation we're, we're running at each other from an angle the next time i'm gonna be next to you the next time i might be behind you trying to chase you down but it's still the same situation it's just like what we do in the weight room, training the same strength qualities, but we train them differently. We, ver we vary it exactly the same thing. And I think if you just keep dragging out the same tired drills, they don't become adaptable. I, w I don't want an athlete that can only function doing something that he's seen, right? You want an, an athlete that can be in any situation and figure out his movement toolbox, right? If we're doing a good job preparing them, <clears throat> He should be out on the field and those nice biomechanics that you taught him, cut this way, cut that way, he should be able to do that in response to whatever he sees, not only in the perfect uh, situation that he rehearsed, because then it's just a dance, right? If he can only do it the way he rehearsed it, he, he's a dancer. He's not, he's not an athlete. He's got to be able to uh, respond because we only ever change direction in response to something else. If I have the ball and I turn around and you're not there, I'm not going to change direction, right? I'm just going to run in a straight line to the end zone. So the only reason I ever would change direction is because of you. And the only reason you would ever change direction is because of me. So I think the more we can focus on that symbiotic relationship, uh, uh, the more adaptable the athletes are going to become. And, and here's what I find, because people say, well, what, what do you see on the field? Like, do you see any results? Does it look any different? <clears throat> they become more comfortable being uncomfortable, so to speak, right? So they don't freak out when they're in an open space or they're facing an athlete and he does something that they're, that they're not used to. It doesn't freak them out because they're in, they've been in that situation before. Whereas if you've only trained them in environments that are predictable, in an unpredictable situation, they're going to freak out. Oh, I'm not ready for this. Crap. Well, whatever. I mean, I know how I move. Uh, I don't know how he's going to move, but I'm good at reading. I'm good at perceiving. Let's do this. I love it. And I love the fact that it, it, it again, goes and follows just that simple, general to specific, and continuing to build upon what you've done before. So then I guess I would be remiss... Um, being such a, a playa oriented person myself and not asking how all that fits in. So where does that come in with all of this? Because that's just a whole other animal right. of itself. Right. Absolutely. So, I mean, <clears throat> those are position specific as well, but now obviously there's a general component to that as well. So we'll do, we'll do plyos, um, for, I guess two different ways. One way would be just for like general explosive slash reactive strength. So that might be, and those are typically vertical plyos. Whatever our vertical plyos uh, are, the, those are generally fairly uniform across the group. Um, and we'll do that to develop general explosive strength. Um, and that will be done in the weight room as, as part of the strength workout um, and, and fairly uniform. And the goal of that is output. Right. Whatever we're doing, if we're jumping on a box, jump on a higher box, if we're, you know, doing depth jumps, get off the ground fast, you know, whatever it may be. But that's that's for output. Then out on the field, we'll do position specific plyos that may uh, transfer more to your position. And when we talk about transfer, we talk basically about movement planes. Right. We basically is, is how it will differ. So. Um, when with linebackers, running backs, uh, et cetera, with that position group, I tend to do more lateral plyos, um, with, uh, with skill guys, typically more horizontal plyos. Um, and if you, if you look at the skill, if the skill workout, a lot of times it looks more like, it looks like what you might see in a track and field workout, bounding, 
you know, power skipping, um, things of that nature. With as I mentioned, the uh, linebackers and running backs more in the lateral plane. Um, with offensive linemen, I like to work uh, the rotational plane because a lot of times uh, <clears throat> the forces placed on them or or where they get hurt a lot of times are rotational, rotational torque, rotational. Uh, forces on the knee, et cetera. So I like them to be able to jump and do 90 degree turns, 180 degree turns, and still be able to land and stabilize, usually on one leg. Um, as I mentioned, the skill guys bounding, um, power skipping for distance, jumping for distance, hurdle hops, things like that. And then with the, the, the big skill running backs, linebackers, um, <clears throat> lateral skater bounds, um, ski hops, things like that more, as I mentioned, lateral in nature. And the, those aren't, it's not like that's the only ones we do, but that's, that's really the focus is changing the plane and emphasizing a certain plane um, that will transfer more to the movements that we're working. So we're, when we're out on the field, it's really a complement to our movement program. And then in the weight room, just like a lot of the stuff we do in the weight room is general, we're going to squat for maximal strength. We're going to deadlift for maximal strength. We're going to jump, do a jump variation more explosive strength, uh, more general, and then out on the field, more specific transferring to their position or the movements that we're going to ask them to do. I love it, man. I do. And I think that the, the breakdown is, is simple, but it's right on point. Good looking at what those guys do on the field and understanding that you've got to prepare them in each one of those aspects when it comes from the general to what, you know, is kind of that general preparatory to the special preparatory to the specialized exercises when it comes into the running and the sprinting that actually have the translation to what you're trying to do. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it sounds like ABC to me. Mm -hmm. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And, and one thing that we, one thing that I kind of try to emphasize too is um, we, and this may sound kind of crazy to people too, but we test something every week. Now it's it's and I I kind of brought up the the analogy of and people are going to think I'm a, I'm a West Side guy or something, but but West Side for movement that's kind of what we do. Like we test something every week. So I'll, I'll just use my skill guys for instance. The receivers they get some sprint variation laser timed every week. It might be a ten, it might be um, a flying ten. It might be a flying 20. It might be a 20. It might be um, a 10-yard sprint where the snap of the ball triggers the laser rather than your movement so, so I can get a realistic uh, look of who can react rather than who's just fast in a closed environment. And I'm not saying that those are all the, be the best sprint variations that you have to do. I'm just giving an example of um, when we train speed – or we train for output, you need output, right? It, it implies, we all know that in order to get stronger, we track that, right? We track getting stronger by how much weight you put on the bar, right? Mm -hmm. You, you got to get stronger. You got to lift heavier weights. But then we'll go out on the fields and we'll train speed. And, and really, we're just training effort because nobody has any idea of how fast anybody's moving. So I really just wanted to put numbers on that, you know, and the volume is very low. You know, the volume is very, it's not a conditioning session. We might, we might do, you know, two or three timed flying tens, right? But guess what? Those flying tens are fast. And when you compare it to, um, you know, when you break it down or you convert it, which I do to velocity, you know, these guys are running 22, um, you know, 22, 23 miles an hour are fastest guys. It's fast, right? I know that that's speed work. And we're only going to do two or three reps, and then we'll, we'll go do something else, you know? And, and when we condition, yeah, we'll do higher volumes and a lot of reps, et, et cetera, like, like anybody would do. But, but I wanted to mention that because I think that that's, that that's kind of unique. And then in, in the jumps, when we do those jumps, like I talked about, when we do the output-oriented jumps, we're tracking that too. If we're jumping on a box, it's what's the highest box you can get to with good technique and, and not landing like a gargoyle on, on a ledge, you know, landing with a good landing position. But what's the highest box you can get onto? What, you know, if we're doing, you know, maybe <clears throat> how heavy of a vest can you wear or, you know, and those are just 
examples out of left field, but, but having pushing the envelope of output on movement skills, just like you would on a strength exercise, add weight, add weight. All right. That's, you know, and I think when we talk about output, that's what you need to do. I love that because at the end of the day, those exercises that you're testing on the field are your KPIs because if yes. a football fast mm-hmm. player is faster and changes direction quicker and reacts better, I think that kid's going to be pretty darn good at football. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's, and that brings it back to uh, not, not having to choose either or, you know, it's, I don't only work on the perceptive abilities, you know, D- don't only be a track guy and only get them fast. Don't only be a meathead and only get them strong. Why not? Why not do all of those things, right? And you say, well, then you become of, then you become a you know jack of all trades, master of none. Well, first of all, I try to be a master of all, <laughs> of all of those, you know. But I realize that you can't be great at everything. But but that's football. Football contains each of those aspects. So then we come back to. What you what your first question was, which is the positional differences. Every position is going to train everything that we just talked about. But guess who is going to spend more time emphasizing heavy lifting? The linemen, right? Guess who is going to spend more time worried about what their laser times are? The skill guys. Um, you know, and why is that? Because just look at their position, Mm -hmm. right? So the linemen are going to do speed as well, but I'm not as worried about that as I am pushing the deadlift or pushing the squat numbers, right? And then for the skill guys, they're obviously going to come in the weight room and lift too, because we all know that getting stronger will help them get faster, especially because these are college age kids. Some of them are 18 years old. Deadlifting more will still make them faster. You know, maybe, maybe not four or five years from now, it might be diminishing returns, but now that's still an important piece for them. But relative to the other positions, we've got to spend more time and more focus working on maximal velocity, maximal speed work, um, et cetera. So, so that's where I kind of circling back to your first question, that's where the positional stuff comes in. What is important biomotor ability wise, what is important for that position um, um, relative to the other positions. I love it, man. Scott, this is absolutely some fantastic stuff. It's absolutely killer. I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today, man. Where can people see more of what you're doing, follow you on the socials, all that? Yeah, so uh, my Twitter is uh, at TTU underscore Coach Sal. Um, and my uh, Instagram handle is uh, fasttwitch 68 Uh, 68 was my college number and obviously I'm fast twitch. So, um, and so, but really, uh, you know, reach out to me in person because I prefer to have conversations, you know, like when people, where can I get your stuff? Just call me and we'll wrap, you know, um, just fly sports. You mentioned Joel earlier, just fly sports has, has a lot of my stuff on their articles, podcasts, et cetera. Um, but, um, yeah, reach out to me, hit me up, you know, message me on Twitter or whatever, and then and then maybe we can get in contact and, and talk. Yeah, man. Appreciate it, brother. This is absolutely fantastic. People are going to love this. I appreciate it, Jay. Thank, thank you for your time. Yeah, man. Well, we'll be in touch real soon, brother. Thank you. Absolutely. And a huge thank you to Texas Tech, Scott Saulwasser, for spending the time with us today. Guys, an absolutely no-holds-barred, no holding back, candid, open, honest discussion on where he sees things fitting and not just his program, but where we as coaches can all be better. I cannot thank Scott enough for being so open, honest, candid today. This this was sensational. Scott, thank you so much. Guys, as always, I hope you enjoyed the talk as much as I did. And if you did, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. If there's anyone you know that could take something from this talk and could help better their athletes, tag them below, DM DM them the talk, email them the talk, whatever it may be. Again, guys, we are just trying to get the best information out there to all the great coaches that we possibly can. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. 
We will see you then.